we've just been talking about our uh, the Professor Holland's uh, talk and pondering all sorts of ethical things in the way we think about animals and humans. So I want to thank Professor Holland for really kicking us off with a, a deep dive into the serious questions that we're, uh, we're pondering uh, over the next couple days. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I do want to uh, talk about some upcoming programs. Uh, tomorrow we have another edition of Lunch with Friends and Strangers, and it is our first object biography. We're going to be with uh, Vicki Ravine from the uh, Art History Department, uh, and we're going to be talking about the Pith Helmet, which is the biography of the Pith Helmet. And I tell you, I, having teaching uh, French colonialism, uh, I am absolutely excited about this. It'll be our first attempt to do the biography of an object, so come on by for that. Uh, at 12 o'clock, we'll be running that program. A very important change I want to make clear, normally Lunch with Friends and Strangers always runs at Friday at 12. However, Heidi King will be coming and talking about Jade Snow Wong, uh, Asian American act actor, uh, on Wednesday at 12. And we did this, of course, uh, next Friday is a university close day. So please, if that's already on your calendar, switch it over to, uh, to Wednesday at 12. Uh, and then we'll pick up with the final edition of that for the spring uh, with Philip Gur uh, Gura and William Apes on April 9th, again on a Friday. So I want to remind you of that. I also, of course, want to remind you all of the Adams Symposium coming up on April 16th and 17th. We have Professor Liz Anderson from Michigan, uh, the University of Michigan, lots of Michigan in the house tonight, uh, from, the, from the University of Michigan coming and talking about um, the work ethic, coming, of course, virtually, that is. Uh, and it'll be, you know, what does the work ethic mean in the 21st century? It uh, should be an absolutely fascinating talk. She is one of the world's renowned philosophers on labor and the meaning and uh, the ethical dimensions of it. Uh, so we're excited to welcome Professor Anderson. And the following day, we will have our Adam Symposium where we will uh, bring scholars in to respond to Professor Anderson's talk and, and allow Professor Anderson to have a chance to respond to the respondents. So uh, the, keep that in mind. Uh, we have one more Adventures and Ideas uh, coming up at the end of April with Matt Andrews about the Olympics. And so that should be a wonderful uh, talk, uh, four talks, a distinguished uh, scholar series on the history of the Olympics and just about everything you could possibly ever want to know about the uh, International Games, which I understand will happen in Tokyo this year. So uh, please bear that in mind. And finally, I do want to remind you folks, I'll say it again. Uh, it's odd to say don't give money to us today, uh, but please consider going on Tuesday to give UNC and giving a donation of any size. If we have 25 people who donate on Tuesday through the portal on Give UNC, it'll unlock $25,000 for Carolina Public Humanities and help us uh, continue our very important mission. So those are some little details for you. Let's get right to our next talk and our next speaker. Um, this is a, uh, our next speaker is, a, is I, I dare say, an old friend of Carolina Public Humanities, although he's a young scholar, he's an old friend of Carolina Public Humanities, is Al Duncan, assistant professor in classics. I mentioned uh, there's a lot of Michigan in the house. He uh, received his BA from Michigan and did his uh, doctoral work at Stanford. Uh, he has uh, uh, done so much work with us. He's an expert on Greek uh, drama and Greek tragedy, and both in looking at it scholarly and also in actually organizing performance and analyzing performance. It's done some great work in South Africa, even doing Greek, uh, uh, Greek drama in South Africa. Uh, in progress right now is his work called Ugly Productions, Genre and Aesthetics in Athenian Drama. Uh, and uh, he is sweating it out and working away at it, and uh, it should be out for publication soon enough. Uh, we, what I, uh, I, I mentioned, Al Duncan has come and spoken to Carolina Public Humanities so many times, a good friend of our program, and when we were putting this together, I thought to myself, you know, what about Aesop's fables? Wouldn't they be something? And I, I know this isn't exactly what, uh, what Professor Duncan does, but I, I called Al, or wrote Al, and I asked him, and he said, well, I just so happen to be reading these stories to my son right now, and I'm interested, and very generously, like he always does, maybe he's a sucker for it, but he, he said, yep, I'll come and do it. So um, without further ado, we are really, really happy to welcome back to the Carolina Public Humanities stage, Men Acting Like Animals, Acting Like Men, Aesop, Aristophanes, and Becoming a Better Human with Al Duncan. Take it away, Al. Good evening, everyone, and thanks, Max. Uh, thanks for the invitation. You're always too kind to keep bringing me back for these, and you're right, I'm a complete sucker for Carolina Public Humanities, and I'm just going to be keeping coming on back. 
whether I know what I'm talking about or not. We'll see how it goes tonight. Um, in addition to thanking Max, I would like to thank Vicki Breeden, Paul Benici, who's fearlessly running tech for this, uh, Brian, Susan, Lloyd, and the entire Carolina Public Humanities team who managed to pull off these intricately complex logistics of a Zoom presentation and make it look effortless. Um, thanks, too, to my co-presenters. While it's very intimidating to follow her, I'm very grateful to share the podium with Professor Sharon Holland and to share in the wonder of you watching at home with just a magisterial presentation before. I'm also looking forward to Professor Fennig's uh, talk tomorrow and especially to our final panel discussion. Last but not least, after a transformative year that's changed our sense of togetherness, I'm very grateful to be back physically in Flyleaf Books and back virtually with you all. Uh, we faced a lot of challenges and maybe some new opportunities over the past year. Uh, we found new ways to be together even when we're apart. Uh, and as these vaccination campaigns are rolling out, um, I'm hoping that the Academy as a whole and things like Carolina Public Humanities as an you know, individual organization you know, seizes this lesson and this opportunity for a more inclusive public scholarship. To be able to have these things and reach you at home across the country, it's a really remarkable thing. And I know Max and the team are very much dedicated to doing this within the state of North Carolina already. Maybe the rest of the university and higher ed generally, Max, could take a lesson from all this. Well, to pick up on Max's backstory, when he first emailed me to test the waters for this talk, Little did he know that I've been secretly a cryptozoologist interested in animals in classical antiquity for a very long time. Um, too long, I'm afraid, and in too desultory a fashion uh, to wrangle easily into a coherent hour-long presentation. This is because animals pervade our evidence from antiquity from the sorceress Circe transforming Odysseus's men into pigs to Aristotelian anatomic, uh, <clears throat> anatomical investigations, from prognostication based on birds, this is awe suspecium in Latin, uh, where we get the word auspicious from, um, or even to Roman love poetry, where birds would serve as metaphors from anything to Roman imperial extravagance to body parts, which I would be ashamed to mention in front of you all, um, even virtually. Uh, when talking about animals in Greece and Rome, uh, there's a lot of ground and sky and water to cover. So although I've been thinking about animals for some time now, uh, this is an ex especially timely discussion that we're having in spring 2021. Animals are resurgent, and not just because there are fewer cars on the road and more seed in our bird feeders. Even before the pandemic, creatures have been tickling our fancies in new ways, in the humanities especially. Gone are the days uh, when, uh, in my field, uh, Sir Darcy Wentworth Thompson, the Scottish naturalist from the turn of the 20th century, could pen these huge tomes surveying the birds and fish of the ancient world according to the most recent Linnaean taxonomies. Those days are gone. At a time when so many species are on the brink of an extinction for which we humans are tragically responsible, we've become interested in animals in less encyclopedic uh, but arguably much more profound ways. And as we grow increasingly aware of our own foibles and limitations as a species, and we are a species just like any animal species, uh, we're turning to study animals not only to better understand or further dominate the natural world, uh, but to gain new insight into ourselves. Um, uh, Dr. Holland was talking about primatology and the different things involved in there. So whether you're thinking about Jane Goodall or Robert Sapolsky or any of the many people who have looked to primates for inspiration into ourselves, in the academy and in the wild of popular discourse, we're all turning to animals right now uh, as an extension or perhaps correction to our own humanity. So as part of this zoological zeitgeist, um, new hybrid phrases and concepts are uh, arising. We, I'm, I'd introduce transhuman. There's also the hum animal, which we've just heard about. Or perhaps, and most troubling for Carolina public humanities, uh, post-humanities, which sounds a little bit troubling. Uh, these terms have become en vogue. Now, such terms and the allied approaches that they represent are part of a broader anti-anthropocentric term. Um, the broad goal of which is to unsettle human supremacy and absolute subjectivity. Again, this is repeating a lot of what Dr. Holland has to say. 
These epistemological positions owe much the work of Greeks, of Aristotle and his school uh, in particular, which placed man, and I do mean that as man, it's a gender term, uh, exclu man exclusively at the very summit of animalian perfection, with degradations beginning at woman and continuing on there to the lowest of animals. This transhuman turn is indeed a useful connection, or correction, I should say, to this human, lest I say male, arrogance, and it represents a new dawn that's casting light on exciting horizons of study. But this scholarly turn is in some ways actually a return to very early human notions of connectedness with our natural and animal worlds, reflected in ancient Greek popular wisdom. If we can get back before Aristotle, a different picture of human-animal relations starts to emerge. It turns out that we've been learning about ourselves by seeing ourselves as animals for quite some time. So how do I go about spinning a yarn from all of these loose threads and bringing my focus closer to my own wheelhouse, which as Max said, it's Greek drama. Well, as my title, and you can see it on the screen, Men Acting Like Animals, Acting Like Men, suggests, tonight I'll be taking a performance-minded approach to animals in Greek antiquity, one informed by my own background in theatrical performance and literary studies, but also, I hope to convince you here tonight, much of the ancient evidence as well. It's not just Duncan's opinion. I'm fascinated, though, by the way that we humans not only look to animals and nature for better understandings of ourselves, um, as both Epicurean philosophers in the ancient world would and modern evolutionary biologists like Dr. Fennig tomorrow will do, uh, but also our habit of casting animals in our own image in order to reformulate questions we have about what it means to be human. So we're not just learning from the animal world, we take an extra step. We project ourselves onto the animal world and then see what reflects back upon us. Why, in short, do we see ourselves more clearly through the lens of other animals? And why are we attracted to this process? And I should say this process is as alive and well today as it was two and a half millennia ago. Whether we look at Gary Larson's comic strip, uh, The Far Side, uh, and I owe this example to my uh, Duke colleague, uh, Karen Shapiro, we were talking about this earlier this morning, uh, or uh, the Berenstein Bears, uh, to choose just one of any number of children's series, um, where we see animals engaging in the quotidian, there's a way that we still like to see ourselves through animals. Now, to quote from the 2003 television series theme song, and can you tell on this, I, I have small children, <laughs> um, to the Berenstein Bears program, there's a, a line that goes, they're kind of furry around the torso. They're a lot like people, only more so. Now, my six-year-old son, uh, who on a side note just went to his first day of in-person kindergarten today, um, is an adept cultural critic. And the second line of this couplet drives him up the wall. What does it mean for animals not only to be like people, but to, be, to actually surpass humans in their humanity? How are they a lot like people, only more so? Uh, behind this apparent paradox, the Berenstain paradox, let's call it, lies, I believe, a profoundly performative move which humans across time and cultures have tended to make. We take animals not merely as objective data sets for understanding our own place in the cosmos, but as an essential and external cipher a subjective position from which we can reimagine and perhaps refashion our own proper human identities. Casting ourselves in the roles of animals, we conceptualize what it means to be human in new and insightful ways. Now tonight I'll be interested in particular in how Greeks used animals to think through apparent links between identity and behavior, or perhaps appearance and performance, if we want to take a more theatrical approach to those terms, and the ways that this mental and social processing fosters mindful self-awareness, and with any luck, maybe I can convince you, maybe we can get there, genuine ethical development. Now, to do this, we'll be looking at works attributed to some early Greek authors, especially Aesop and Aristophanes. Uh, each of whom make programmatic use of animals who act like men and like women. In my own research, I've thought a lot about Aesop as an ugly figure, one whose homely appearance, not unlike that of Socrates, stood in marked contrast to the beautiful wisdom which he dispensed. Indeed, we can follow Plato in drawing strong parallels between Socrates and Aesop. 
Two of these parallels, which I think are of particular importance, are one, their common concern with human nature and moral action. They're both very humanist in terms of philosophers. And number two, the fact that Aesop, like Socrates, seems to have preferred oral discussion to writing and never committed any of his works to text. Now this inconvenient truth, <laughs> combined with Aesop's position, you can see it, uh, all the essential facts on the slide, um, Aesop's position at the very cusp of the historical record, early 6th century BCE, makes it impossible to, to, to determine, sorry, which fables Aesop himself did or did not compose. As a result, some scholars prefer not to speak of Aesop, but of Aesopica, the, a motley collection of animal favor, fables written in Greek of all stripes. You can tell it's not from one era, as well as Latin, which was a language that was definitely not in broad circulation uh, during uh, Aesop's time. So while I might refer simply to Aesop as the author of these fables in this talk, I do so like a physicist working in quantum mechanics might refer to an electron. Aesop's not a single author fixed in time or space, but a dynamic force who's best understood as constrained by certain laws, namely, one, short form stories, independent of a broader narrative context. Two, these stories feature animal protagonists who act and quite often speak like humans. And three, who engage in situations that may be easily universalized. They might be a specific context, but that has broad applications. Those are the three governing rules behind Aesopica, whoever we attribute those works to. Aesop, then, should be considered a genre as much as an author. And from a functional perspective, a set of narratives like this can contain wisdom and profound understanding just like a human. We might look beyond humanity as an individual thing, but as a set of practices is what makes us human. And it's not surprising that in later antiquity, there were movements to add Aesop, whoever he was, to the canonical list of seven sages, such as Solon and Thales of Miletus, who were his contemporaries. Now, how about the other star of our show, Aristophanes, the fifth century comedic playwright about whom we have a comparative wealth of information. Much of this is conveyed actually in the playwright's own words, but some of the evidence is also external and pretty valid. Born in or around 446 BCE, Aristophanes' dramas engaged with a wide variety of political and cultural topics, which concerned his home city of Athens during the late fifth century, a time of war, plague, and political and cultural upheaval. And those of you who have been reading great books with me for CPH, you know all about this. <laughs> We've talked about the fifth century before. As a playwright of old comedy, Aristophanes drew from rich, pre-comedic traditions of animal parades. And I'll have a list for further reading at the end of this presentation. You could see some of the works by Rothwell and Sifakis on these topics. Um, and in his extant works, Aristophanes, that is, uh, he presented spectacular choruses of wasps and birds. Now, Aristophanes didn't limit himself just to animals when creating these spectacular choruses. His nebulous clouds come to mind, and with the blockage of the Suez Canal this week, I can't help but point out that he also wrote a play that I really wish we had called Merchant Vessels, <laughs> Merchant Ships. Uh, could be a tragedy this week, but hopefully it'll all work out. Nor was Aristophanes the only poet to use animal choruses. Uh, we have a variety of ancient titles from other office, uh, authors, including one called The Ants, which I'd be very interested in. But Aristophanes, although he was part of this broader context, seems to have found his own distinctive way of engaging with animals, one which scholars such as Edith Hall have noted is in very close dialogue with the early Aesopic tradition. It makes sense to read these two authors against one another. Now, we're going to get to the examples soon, but I have one important caveat before going further. We Americans and maybe Westerners have been known to speak in an aggrandizing or exceptional way about the Greek and Roman inheritance. Now, every culture engages with animals, and as a result, every culture uses animals to better understand humanity. It's what people do. I don't believe there's anything inherently special about Greek engagement. And there are the substantial epistemological and social dangers that accrue when we talk endlessly about Aesop's fox, perhaps, and not the spider Anansi of West African tradition, or coyote from North America. But 
If Greek responses to the animal world do have any special claim to our consideration in North Carolina or wherever we find ourselves in 2021, it's the result of a paradoxical cultural distance and nearness of these Greek paradigms. And what I mean by that is the Greek examples are distant, obviously separated by two and a half millennia, a language, climate, flora, fauna, the list goes on. But they're near because Aesop and maybe to a lesser extent Aristophanes have become culturally pervasive. Wittingly or not, when we talk about sour grapes or the lion's share, it's Aesop who's on our tongues. Such metaphors can have profound cultural effects. And the presence of these animals, a cast of characters that are familiar from children's stories, folklore songs, these support the early formative exposure of these authors. We know about Aesop because we get him early. So I hope in the discussion that starts tonight and follows tomorrow, we can engage in some comparative and maybe even reparative readings of Aesop and Aristophanes alongside other folk tales, other traditions, other lived human experiences that will really embrace and enrich the discussion. Now, one reason for the broad appeal of these animal stories is the fact that animals are, as the title of the chapter by Babette Pütz that Vicky kindly shared this morning in PDF form, uh, it's the fact that animals are good to laugh with. They're familiar to us. They're subhuman, and that nature makes them conceptually approachable, even when it might be absolutely terrifying to approach a real lion in the wild. Their behavioral patterns upset our human social norms pooping in the house of the move house in Philadelphia, for example, generating an, an endless variety of humor when we ask animals to act like men. This is what's funny, right? The disconnect. But this is hardly to say that animals dumb down narratives. On the contrary, concrete and manifest presences of the animals support abstract and metaphorical thinking. They're very good to think with for the same reasons that they're very good to laugh with. All right. Now, with the theoretical historical framing out of the way, we might as well take a cue from Aesop and get to a concrete, a concrete example uh, and save the moralizing for the end. All right, let's begin with a familiar fable, that of the wolf in sheep's clothing. And this is 239 according to Ben Edwin Perry's index system. So there are always numbers for these. It's a complete mess trying to follow the order of uh, um, Aesopica. So find the number and you'll find the tale. Here it goes. A certain wolf could not get enough to eat because of the watchfulness of the shepherds. But one night he found a sheepskin that had been cast aside and forgotten. The next day, dressed in the skin, the wolf strolled into the pasture with the sheep. Soon a little lamb was following him about and was quickly led away to slaughter, nature's slaughterhouse. That evening, the wolf entered the fold with the flock. But it happened that the shepherd took a fancy for mutton broth that very evening and, picking up a knife, went to the fold. Then there, the first he laid hands on and killed was the wolf. And the moral of the story is the evildoer often comes to harm through his own deceit. Now, this text and this image is pulled from the uh, uh, US Libraries, uh, library.gov website for this. This is the Library of Congress. Uh, it's free, it's public access, it's lovely. And these pictures are animated sometimes, which can be a little bit disorienting, like a uh, Harry Potter movie, but it's worth checking out. Now, this short and well-known story and the appended moral touches on many issues, uh, perhaps most notably what we might call karma or just desserts, uh, but also chance, happenstance, vigilance, gullibility, self-interest, and desperation. Another theme that I'd like to introduce might be labeled performance or theatricality. And I wish to highlight in particular how the wolf is the ur-thespian here. <laughs> Finding a costume by chance the wolf plays a new role, inspired by his observations and especially by the materials at hand. Through his convincing portrayal, he even convinces his rather succulent audience to go along with him. But he becomes too good of an actor, and that brings him to his own tragic end. In just a few sentences, then, this story encapsulates animals' internal and external characteristics, their genuine and assumed behavior, deception, and the like. The story is ironically performative in ways that are worthy of an analysis by Judith Butler. The wolf acts as a wolf in that he surreptitiously satisfies its hunger, that's what wolves do, while also acting as a sheep. 
The shepherd acts as the protector of the sheep while also acting as the killer of one sheep that he plans to eat for dinner. As the appended morals suggest, deceit, which we might extend into play acting, you know, a kind of willful, playful deception, ramifies uncontrollably and entails moral danger. That's another takeaway from this story. But such moralizing presupposes in the very first place that some behaviors are natural or genuine or authentic and others not. And that to, to transgress such norms is potentially harmful, not only for the doer, but for society as a whole. Um, I don't know if, uh, what, what happens after the story, we're left to kind of ask those questions, but uh, does the uh, uh, shepherd check his <laughs> mutton next time? Uh, does, do other wolves learn from this? We're asked to kind of wonder some of these questions. So I may be going too deep into my interpretation of this single fable, but I think that is, to a large extent, the very point. These short fables are not meant for continuous performance. They're not an epic. Uh, they're much closer in, in function to a museum piece. They're objects for discussion. They provoke social and deliberative response. So in this respect, fables are also not so different from dramatic narratives. They give the audience a diverse set of characters with different motivations and behaviors and appearances, and we're asked to figure it out. So the wolf in sheep's clothing, then, is emblematic of some of the core concerns of this talk. Like the cast-off sheepskin, animal skins of Aesopic fables, the species that are on display, and Aristophanic comedy are often simultaneously superficial and profound. Superficial in that their very changeability raises the question of what is an internal character and how constant is that attribute. What nature do we all share? Is it self-interest? Is it something else? How is there uniformity within these life forms? Is there something radically the same about this? And is that maybe anthropomorphic in some way? It's also profound in the sense that these core behaviors of animals are not so easily overcome. And that how one presents oneself has a substantial impact on one's social interactions. So uh, although it was easy for the wolf to pick up uh, the, the sheep skin and wear it in, he found it not so easy to take off at the moment he needed it. At, at that moment, it was somehow profound, more than just superficial. So in the rest of this talk, I'll lay out some of the historical and literary foundations for Greeks' interactions with animals. This will have to be a rough survey with many abbreviations and ellipses, but that's all right. I hope it will at least give a helpful backdrop for discussion and maybe a helpful basis for argument. We'll then turn to several more of Aesop's fables to see how identity and behavior were, in, uh, were kind of blended in that figure of the hum animal. And what character and instinct, performance, and behavior, all of those things have to say about what it means to be human. We'll ask why the Greeks thought it was worth learning from animals and how deep or superficial they themselves thought this knowledge might be. And from there, we'll explore Aristophanes' spectacular engagement with animals in the theater. First in Wasps, a play about the Athenian government and the ways that tribal politics can turn us all into animals. And finally, Birds, a play which sees in animals the possibility of utopian transcendence, but in which people, or at least some people, are tragically unable to escape from their own human nature. All right. On the origin of a species of narrative. <laughs> animals, Ainoi, and the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks were fascinated with their environment, or perhaps their ecology, a word that we derive from the Greek word oikos, home, and logos, study, or a rational account. Greek myth provides a rational account of nature on the grandest scale. Not only do we have the Olympic pantheon, gods of sky, water, and earth in the form of brothers Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, or Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto, if you prefer the Roman uh, uh, options, uh, but also the agrarian gods, Demeter, Dionysus, Ceres, Bacchae, the huntress Artemis, or Diana, uh, and the innumerable river gods, woodlands, sea nymphs, etc. But as you'll note, unlike some other major polytheistic systems, the Olympic, god, god, the Olympic gods are uniformly anthropomorphic, or human-shaped. Hybridity is more often a sign of monstrosity than div divinity. We might think of satyrs, centaurs, or even the god Pan, who's not found on Olympus, but out in remote other mountains, right? He's not one of the 12. Um, 
But if we don't count them among the gods, animals presented a special point of concern in Greek cosmology. The goddess closest to them, Artemis, betrays this ambivalent relationship. She's goddess of the hunt, depicted with a bow and arrow and a cult titer master of animals, or mistress of animals, Patnia Theron. Uh, but we'll see in Artemis an interesting connection uh, to the wild and the feminine, something that we might talk about more in the discussion. And the idea that domination and violence may be part of this interaction. She loves the animals, but she also hunts them. It's a bit peculiar. Now, myth is one thing, but we also see this relationship of violence and dominance with animals in broader Greek life. Civilization for the Greeks was defined by the word erga, works, or fields, and nature was defined in kind of contrapositive terms by wilderness. Animals marked this distinction. Uh, you might think of the difference between a pig and a boar, an ox or a wild bull. Domestication, the liminality of animals between those who are in the wild and those who are in the works. Now, we, we could look to more mythic examples. Actaeon, the hunter who becomes transformed into the hunted. And there are many of these stories in Greek myth of transhuman interchange. Uh, most of these are Greek, but then get presented to us most digestibly in Ovid's Metamorphoses. But in science and in society, humans tended to make strong distinctions between themselves and animals. But in these mythic narratives, all were equally subject to the gods' will and violence, and there was actually a fungibility between human and animal corporeal forms, as we see with Actaeon. Now, it's this kind of background between the interchange between humans and animal forms that uh, might give context to one of our earliest animal fables. And this it comes from Hesiod, a near contemporary of Homer, writing maybe 50 to 100 years after. Um, but he's pulling from an oral tradition that dates much earlier. Like talking about Aesop, it's hard to pin down a year for this guy. Now, this Ainos, this fable, comes from the Works and Days, a didactic poem about nature, farming, and related moral precepts, um, in which this story fits actually quite nicely. In this Ainos, we have a hawk and a nightingale. And the form of this and the way it's presented suggests an independent uh, transmission or tradition of these sorts of tales. Now, uh, I'll just read parts of it, but it's up there for you. Give me a moment for a sip. <clears throat> I'll put on my best Homeric rhapsode voice. <clears throat> now I shall tell you a fable for kings who have understanding. A hawk spoke to a speckle-necked nightingale cruelly as he lifted her up to the clouds while gripping her tight in his talons. Piteously, she, transfixed by his crooked claws, was lamenting when the imperious hawk addressed her in arrogant parlance. <clears throat> Why, little lady, such shrieks. One stronger than you has got you. Where... Where, where you are going, I'll take you myself, though you are a songstress. For as I please, I'll make you my dinner or give you your freedom. Witless is one who attempts to strive against those who are stronger. So the story goes on. Uh, I want to highlight a few of these words. The fact that we do call this a fable, an Ainos, originally from 650 on. And that the attended audience of this is kings who have understanding. It's tempting to see fables as children's fare. Uh, but this is talking about the um, possible decipherment of the myth, the, of the fable, that this is not completely plain spoken, that even as the myth is easy to digest and understand in its essentials, we're, we're invited to look deeper. Also note that these are speaking characters. The wolf story of entering the fold was completely mute. Uh, mute. Here we have speaking roles, and we're supposed to imagine how this is working out. This is part of a broader narrative. It speaks to the didactic uh, mode of Hesiod. But we can see from the very earliest examples of Greek poetry that the fable is an essential part of the, the backdrop. Now, let's get to the Aesopic tales that Max invited me to talk about. Um, I'm going to have a canid focus here. We're going to be looking at foxes, wolves, and dogs. And each of these has its own character, a clever fox, a, a ravenous wolf, and a loyal or possibly disloyal or disobedient dog who's maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, by comparing these, we'll see that certain trends and traits will emerge between the characterizations, uh, but that we'll also see performativity really rise to the fore as individual characters, individual animals, these canids, have to overcome difficulties in different ways. Let's see 
what they have what they have to say. First, the fox and the mask. This is Perry 27. It's a short one. A fox was one day rummaging in the house of an actor. Of course, I like this one, and came across a very beautiful mask. Putting his paw on the forehead, he said, "What a handsome face we have here. Pity it is. Pity it. Yeah, that it should want." Brains. A bit Victorian of a translation there, but you follow it. Um, what we are encountering here is the superficiality of the mask, that the fact that this is performance that the fox is able to see through, uh, that however flat, uh, how much flattery there might be, and this is something that the fox is normally good at, um, it takes an actor to recognize an actor here. And there's one might ask, why was the fox in the actor's shed at all? we might realize that maybe there's something a little bit more human about this fox than at first met the eye. Let's transition to a wolf, the wolf and the house dog. This one's a little bit longer, Perry 346. There was once a wolf who got very little to eat because the dogs of the village were so wide awake and watchful. Same setup as the uh, wolf in the sheep's clothing. He was really nothing but skin and bones. Again, the superficiality of it all, what's left underneath. And it made him very downhearted to think of it, poor guy. One night, this wolf happened to fall in with a fine, fat house dog who had wandered a little too far from home. The wolf would gladly have eaten him then and there, but the house dog looked strong enough to leave his mark should he try it. So the wolf spoke very humbly uh, to the dog, complimenting him on his fine appearance. You can be as well fed as I am if you want to, replied the dog. <laughs> Leave the woods, there you live miserably. Why, you have to fight hard for every bite you get. Follow my example and you'll get along just beautifully. What must I do? asked the wolf. Hardly anything, answered the house dog. Chase people who carry canes, bark at beggars, and fawn on the people of the house. In return, you'll get tidbits of every kind. Chicken bones, choices of meat, sugar, cake, and much more beside, not to speak of kind words and caresses. The wolf had such a beautiful vision of his coming happiness that he almost wept. I mean, we could really feel it here. But then he noticed that the hair on the dog's neck was worn and the skin was chafed. What's that on your neck? Oh, nothing at all, replied the dog. What, nothing? Oh, just a trifle. But please, tell me. Perhaps uh, you see the mark of the collar to which my chain is fastened. What? A chain, <laughs> cried the wolf. Don't you go wherever you please? Huh? Not always, but what's the difference, replied the dog. All the difference in the world. I don't care a rap for your feast, and I wouldn't take all the tender young lambs in the world at that price and away ran the wolf to the woods. Now, it was obvious to the Greeks as it is to us now with uh, genetic tracing that wolves and dogs are the same thing. They can interbreed. They are made of the same stuff. And yet we see here in two different characters and two character types, a complete opposition of worldview. We see this in, the drama, in dramas as well, Antigone and as many um, countless figures from comedy. What we're seeing in these tales, and I can't say that this is all Aesopic. It might not be the sixth century. The example of the mask puts us at least in the fifth century beyond for some of these. What we're seeing is the emergence of character types. Right? This is the same sort of evolution we see in the theater of masks and characters who, because they're scrutable, when we first open the story, we know what to expect and we just watch the situation play out. These are humans in uh, dog form. These are dogs that are the same but different in character ways that are reflected in their title, in their outward appearance. All right, two more and then we'll get to Aristophanes. The fox and the goat in the well. A fox fell into a well, and though it was not very deep, he found that he could not get out again. After he had been in the well for a long time, um, uh, a thirsty goat came by. The goat thought the fox had gone down to drink, so he asked if the water was good. Oh, the finest in the whole country, said the crafty fox. Jump in and try it. There's more than enough for both of us. The thirsty goat immediately jumped in and began to drink. The fox just as quickly jumped on the goat's back and leaped from the tip of the goat's horns out of the well. The foolish goat now saw what a plight he had gotten into and begged the fox to help him out. But the fox was already on his way to the woods. If you had as much sense as you had beard, old fellow, he said as he ran, you would have been more cautious about finding a way to get out before you jumped in. Moral of the story, look before you leap. And I should say these morals are all appended later. They're, they're changeable. We can look at the textual transmission and tell that they are not part of the original story. 
but they're fulfilling the need that we have of what is universal about this? What are the parts of the character that transfer? And again, when we're seeing that old beard in the goat, uh, it's not necessarily an old goat, but now we know it is an old man. It's someone who should know better. These are animals in, or humans in animal clothing. They're humans acting like animals, acting like men. Last but not least, the wolf and the goat, another parallel tale, and this is Perry 157. A hungry wolf spied a goat browsing at the top of a steep cliff where he could not possibly get at her. Huh, that's a very dangerous place for you, he called out, pretending to be very anxious about the goat's safety. What if you should fall? Oh, please listen to me and come down. Here you can get uh, all you want to the finest, tenderest grass in the country. The goat looked over the cliff and said, how very, very anxious you are about me, she said, and the gender is significant here. And how are you, and how generous you are with your grass. But I know you. <laughs> it's your own appetite you're thinking of, not mine. And then an invitation prompted by selfishness is not to be accepted. I think my six-year-old gets the messages from these things. I think we're making moral, ethical progress. He's becoming a better human. But how can we become better humans from looking at these tales? What can we take away from these animal discussions in Aesop? What we're seeing is that even within just the canid family, that we have individual character types emerging, that they are working within character and also across character. We see the wolf trying to play the fox here and failing to do so. We see the fox always transcendent because of his role. What we're seeing is an interchangeability between these individuals, which is making a uniform playing field of moral space. Um, we don't have a single animal that we are. We're asked, like we are in the theater, to identify in different respects with different characters and take this away. These are deeply performative works. And we're going to see, in, as we pivot to Aristophanes, how these things play out when they're realized on the stage. And we really do have physical men acting as animals. So here we are, Aristophanes, animals as spectacles, and that's important, and as ciphers. So first, we'll talk about wasps. First produced in 422 BCE, this was Aristophanes' eighth play, but his very first to feature animal choruses. Now, that's not entirely coincidental, uh, uh, as it's one of the playwright's most political plays. And it's built around everyone's favorite activity, yours and mine when it comes to politics, jury duty. Jury duty, of course, actually meant something quite different in the radical democracy of late 5th century Athens, when important policies, both domestic and foreign, were daily decided at the popular assembly. Your vote counted in Athens. Not only were citizens remunerated for participating, and that was a fact that made this a preferred pastime of retirees, uh, they were often enticed uh, by the brazen claims of political leaders to ruthlessly persecute the opposition, like a swarm of stinging wasps, whence the title of this play. So it's a political play about the waspish sting of the electorate. Now, while some concepts of wasps, such as a mania for jury duty, are hopelessly foreign from our modern sensibilities, in other ways, as we'll see, the play is striking for its ability to offer contemporary commentary on American politics. The play takes its name from the chorus, uh, but in a surprising move, they begin not dressed as wasps, but as men. Older, comparatively undereducated male Athenian citizens who feel they've become culturally and administratively disenfranchised by the elites and see national politics as a way to shore up their own identity. Are, are we starting to sound familiar? But don't get too comfortable too quickly with the analogy because their political champion of these waspish Athenians is the leftist politician Cleon, leftist here. We get our first glimpse of the chorus as they arrive to free their local organizer, Philocleon, uh, out from under the house arrest that's been imposed by his son. In Greek, this is Delocleon, but I assign the Minic translation who sensibly adjusts this to Contracleon. Uh, for today's divided families, and I know there are a lot of them out there, we might have imagined like a love trump, loathe trump uh, duality, or maybe a feel in the burn, uh, won't get burned, something like that. That's the kind of 
play of names that's going on. The chorus arrives and they say, come on, hurry up. Laches, uh, a major political figure on the right, is up in court today and he's got plenty of money stashed away. Cleon, our glorious leader, told us to arrive in plenty of time with three days rations of mean spirit so we can really punish him for his crimes. This is all when they're citizen males. Nothing surprising here. Nothing to look at. But as they're trying to re uh, get Philocleon out of the, his son's house arrest, they're running into obstacle after obstacle, and they ejaculate here, this is outrageous, appalling, barefaced dictatorship. Oh, Athens, my city, the sights that'll fear us. Can I say this on uh, Scar? The shites that can fior uh, that like Fioris, and any other brown-nosed creep that crawls for the cause. Thanks for the uh, thumbs up, Max. Um, Xanthius, a slave in the household working for uh, Contracleon, says, "Heracles, they've got stingers." At this very moment, the chorus has whipped off their cloaks, exposed their kind of uh, paunch and uh, comically padded bodysuit, and instead of a hanging outsized phallus, which was the normal appendage of the Athenian comic chorus, they now have a wasp stinger. So we can see what's going on here where one body part replaces another, where humans are maybe a little bit closer to animals than we'd like to admit, and obviously sexual organs remind us of our anim uh, animal nature, of our uh, physicality of our uh, in, in fleshment, I think was Dr. Uh, Holland's word for that. Oh, and they're the same ones that shafted Philippus, the son of Gorgias, at his trial. It goes on. Uh, and you're next in line for a damn good shaft and attention, left wheel by the center forward march. So we're seeing that they are behaving like you social creatures, like ants or wasps might do, falling in line and pursuing it. They are really waspish in more ways than one. Present stingers, close ranks there, hold the line, wait for it, let your passion, all right, we're back to something that's not a stinger, swell, stand by to swarm into the attack. Um, I, I think, again, this might re recall some recent political memories, for better or for worse. Uh, it's not looking so good, master. I don't rate our chances in a fight with this lot, and I don't like the look of those big pricks. Kind of, you know, uh, tongue-in-cheek there. Uh, let that man go free. Otherwise, you'll wish you were tortoise with a solid shell for a hide. We just can't escape animal metaphor here. And the ways that animal bodies are presenting what the humans would love to have. We want to think about our politics, not just as a war, but as a war between creatures, between species. Come on then, my old jury mates. Their local organizer arrives here. Uh, my lovely little angry wasps, poke your points up their arses. Give their fingers fingers and nasty jabbing, stick your stingers right in their eyes. This is the emergence of that comic chorus, born out of comedic ritual, of parades, of a sumptuousness that's engaging with the body in the comic tradition, now put to a political use. We're mapping a uh, animal body onto the body politic and seeing how that plays out. The scenes go on and eventually Contra Cleon, the son, convinces his father no longer to participate in politics, but he needs to give him a nicotine patch. He needs to do something to address this addiction and decides that instead of having a public court, he'll have a private one at home. And he's looking for some sort of case. Here it happens. Xanthius the slave comes out. The bloody dog, I'm sick of it. Oh, whatever's the matter now, Contra Cleon has had it. It's that dog of ours, Labies. Remember Laches, the rightist politician that was having a court case that day. Now we've got a dog, and this word Labes in Greek means taker. It could be a good dog name, but it's also going to be prophetic. We'll see. He just stormed into the kitchen, grabbed a big piece of Sicilian cheese. Okay, now we're talking about foreign policy. Shoved it in his huge hungry chops, then ran off and scoffed a lot. Oh, wonderful, says Contra Cleon. And we have our first case, the household versus Labes the dog. Xanthius, you'll have to act as prosecuting counsel. Uh, we've already got a prosecutor. The other dog involved in this affair is on record as stating that he will pursue legal proceedings personally should it go to trial. Excellent. Have them both brought before the court. And then a trial ensues. And I think, yeah, the image will come up here. This is an engraving from a late 19th century King's College London production of the Wasps. And you can see the dog defendants there. A huge scene is made out of this. Um, we'll see a little bit of it here. Contra Cleon comes at the very end to offer his final defense. And he says, members of the jury, 
I ask you to show compassion for those afflicted by misfortune. While Labes leads a dog's life out on active service, living off old bones and rotten fish, this lap dog, pointing to Cleon Hound, that's the name that's given to it again, we're seeing animal uh, ciphers appear. And this is worth noting at this point that Aristophanes had gotten in legal hot water about a decade before this production, uh, for stage, or actually about five years before this production, um, in a, for staging a scene that was, uh, that was very critical to the point maybe of slander or, or libel, depending on how you wanted to think of it, against Cleon. And then Cleon, the politician, said that it was slanderous against Athens. And uh, Aristophanes got in a lot of hot water, almost got uh, per perhaps executed or exiled. The stakes were very high. He just squeezes out. Uh, but after that time, he's a little bit more careful. Animal metaphors here allow him to have plausible deniability. It's not Cleon I'm talking about, it's Cleon Hound. It's clearly a joke, this is clearly satire. He's doing smart legal moves even as he's staging a law scene. So that's where the wasps goes. There's a few more, and that's the, the Putz uh, chapter, which I shared, is brilliant for sharing all that you could ever possibly want to know about animals and Aristophanes. We don't have the time tonight, uh, but it's a great play to go further in, and it is remarkably relevant to our contemporary politics of the last five, ten years in the States. Let's move from political, because I think we've had enough of that, uh, to the utopian, the dreamlike, uh, where we'd like our society to go, because I think that's at the moment, again, in this pandemic, where we're now starting to lean. For this, we can turn to Aristophanes' Birds, produced about a decade later, and I'm going to be pulling from two different scenes, again, with Meinick's translation aiding us. We have two heroes um, named in the Manic edition, Good Hope and Make Me Do. Uh, these are rough translations of their Greek names. And they are sick and tired of Athens. There's been a war, there's been a plague, nothing's going right, they're looking for some place to get out. But remember that Aristophanes got in trouble for saying that Athens wasn't the greatest city of all time. Uh, there was a th definitely Athenian exceptionalism, a make Athens great again mentality in the 410s. And Aristophanes is responding to this saying, okay, I can't say any human city is better. Let's put the city up in the sky. Let's make it cloud cuckoo land. The uh, good hope and make me do head out of Athens and they're looking for this guy, the hoopoe. And isn't that a beautiful bird? I wish it was a, one of the, I've had so many birds in my bird feeder, but none of them quite this stunning this spring. Pine warblers have been giving it a, a run for its money. The hoopoe says, unbar the hedgerow, I'm coming out. Enter the hoopoe through the doors, clearly a man wearing a bird mask. Let's come back to that with a long bill and a large crest. See, pictured. Make me do, this pissed the tyrus guy in good hope, you Elpides, fall about laughing. Heracles, what kind of creature is this? Just look at his plumage and that great triple crest. And you are gods. Must have taken all 12 Olympians to have done that to you. I do hope you're not ridiculing my plumage. Remember, strangers, that I was once a man. Oh, we're not laughing at you. What then? It's that beak. <laughs> it looks ridiculous. Again, what we're doing is we're breaking the comic uh, illusion. We're entering into the realm of seeing this costume as obviously insufficient, and we'll find out why in just a moment. Oh, you can blame that damned playwright, Sophocles. He did this to me in that dreadful tragedy of his, Tyrius. So you're Tyrius. Are you really a bird, or do you just strut like a peacock? Again, we're getting to questions of identity, behavior, and who is this guy? He's Tyrius, he's a bird, he's a hoopo. If you know the myth and you know the transformation, again, this is, if you know your Ovid, you know that this was once a king who had some scandalous backstory and was transformed by the gods into this bird. So now he is, he's fully transitioned, and he says, I am indeed a bird. Well, what happened to all your feathers then? They fell out. Have you been unwell? Oh, don't be absurd. Everyone knows that birds molt in winter. Come spring, they'll all be back. Now then, who exactly are you? Now, this is a simple question that you would ask anyone who appeared at your door. But the species divide is now re-entering the picture, and we know that these are Athenian citizens. That's how a member of the Athenian populace would answer this question. I am this person, my father's name is this, and I come from this city. That's how you introduced yourself in Greek. They bypass all of that social hierarchy to say we're humans. 
that's the profound moment here where all of a sudden we're not just staging human difference on stage, we're sp staging species difference. We're dressing as animals, some of us, while also transparently also human underneath in order to break the tyranny of our human social systems. That's the point of this play, to get out into a utopian world. All right, where are you from? Euphemism here. We're from the land of beautiful warships. But Hoopo sees right through that. He knows that's Athens. Oh, you're not jurors, are you? See, the jury joke was ongoing. It makes no sense to us, but they, they got a big hoot out of it. No, not all. In fact, in fact, you might call us jury phobes. Well, I didn't think they had that species in that particular region. Now, this is a little bit minic on the translation, but that animal nature, this reflexivity of this speech is very much there in the original. We're now seeing ourselves as tribes, not of Greeks, but of species, of different global, a cosmopolitanism that is inclusive of the animal world. Why have you come here, gentlemen? Finally, let's get down to business. We wanted to get together with you, whatever for. Here's the payoff. Because once you were a human, just like us. Because you were plagued by debts, just like us. Because you hated paying them, just like us. But then you turned from man to bird and winged it over land and sea, a bird's eye view, you might say. I mean, you've walked on the wild side. We thought you might be able to help us. That in all of your flying about, you've come across a nice, soft, and woolly city where two tired men can snuggle up and live in peace and tranquility. This is the dream. This is the dream to transcend our human form, to be able to get out of these situations that we found ourselves in, that Aristophanes has found himself in, being a politically constrained man. This is his way out. This is the utopianism he's looking for. All right, last section. We've made it. Thanks for holding on, everyone. Birds 466 to 476. Now, Make Me Do here, he's the, the brains of this outfit. Uh, the other guy is kind of the, the tag along. I'm gonna deliver a great big beefed up feet of a stampeding speech and they're going to eat it up. Who's gonna eat it up, you say? The birds. This is the image, again, from a uh, academic production in the 1800s, beautifully engraved. Would that our current modern productions at Playmakers got this sort of artistic treatment, but that, that's a conversation for another time. Um, Make Me Do turns to address the birds and he's gonna convince them of their worth. Uh, Gentlemen, my heart is full of sorrow for the birds. You, who once ruled as kings. As kings? Kings of what? Kings of everything, everyone. Kings of creation. Kings over Zeus himself. Kings more ancient than Kronos, more archaic than the Titans, even older than the Earth. The Earth? Yes, by Apollo. Oh, Zeus, I never knew that. Because you were uneducated. You had no hustle or bustle. You've never learned Aesop's fables, wink. Uh, he says the lark was the first bird, born before even the earth. When her father died, what could she do? No earth, so no earth to bury him under. Makes sense, good problem. Four days he went unburied until she had a brain wave and laid him to rest in her own head. Oh, so that's the origins of bird brain. Wah, wah. Again, some artistic liberties from Meinick, but uh, bless him, he's somebody who writes for performance. I wish more classicists did that. What do we make of this engagement with the animal world? As you can see from the engraving, this play is all about spectacle. It's all about the plumage. But as we recall from the Hoopo scene, this is also making a sly intertextual engagement, maybe intertheatrical engagement's a better word for it, with the play of Sophocles, Tyrius, where the prop master, the scenery guy, didn't come through all the way, and this was a place where an artist could dig into another artist's work, and Aristophanes could critique tragedy and tragedy's presentation and not being so full-throated as his own uh, comic bird chorus would be. This is, again, the essential materiality of these sorts of transformations, these sorts of dramatic performances. This is where Aristophanes is on a completely different level than Aesop because he's about presenting this materially in chorus in the theater of Dionysus before a large audience. We are there to see them. 
But you can never, especially if you're playing birds, escape the humanity underneath. I mean, look at these pictures. These are ugly hybrid feature, figures. Uh, but they tell us something. They tell us about our human longing for transcendence. They tell us, as uh, 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 Make Me Do is telling the chorus here, that with the power of being birds, the power of being transhuman, a hum animal, you're able to be something more than yourself. This is essential ethical positioning. This is a subjectivity that you're able to get outside of your own human brain, your own human head, or your own human society, and reconfigure the game. Now, this is all being used terribly manipulatively. And as the play goes on, spoiler alerts, but I did ask some of you to read it. I know it's busy time, but, but here's the spoiler. It's, it's 25 years, 100 years old. How long can I wait, everyone? Um, you help it, or, uh, sorry, make me do becomes a real tyrant of his own. He becomes the sort of political autocrat, uh, the oppressive system that he wanted to escape. Uh, there's a way that his humanity just couldn't leave him. He was able to convince these noobs, these rubes, these birds, uh, these bird-brained creatures of his own power, but he fell into the trap of maybe more like a fox or maybe more like a dog. Um, he wasn't able to outsmart himself and his own human subjectivity. It's a, it's a bit of a tragedy in that way. So what do we make of all of this? <laughs> I said there were a lot of loose threads. How can we tie this into a meaningful yarn? For this, I want to go back to the Putz article and think about animals as being good to laugh with. That makes them incredibly approachable. Uh, but even while they're approachable and easy to digest, there's something deeper going on under the surface. These are messages for wise kings with understandings. These are messages for politically adept crowds. They may be popular, all these stories, and great with the kids, but this doesn't dumb them down, and we shouldn't frown on them either. Aristophanes did come with a chip on his shoulder, however, when it came to the comedic form. We see in some of these very plays and others, he's engaging with a kind of one-upmanship with tragedy. Tragedy was known as the thing that dispensed goodness, knowledge, truth, real emotions, and character made us more human. I think if you were trying to look for a, a work to assign to the students, you would, you would go, let's go for Antigone uh, to fight um, oppressive systems as opposed to the birds. But there's something about talking about it through animals that is maybe compelling just as much, maybe more. Animals helped Aristophanes to do this, to realize trial scenes that might never have been brought to the stage otherwise, to dream of better cities in ways that he never could if he was actually talking about other Greek spots. Animals' predictability, but then also their inscrutability, makes them very good to think with in a generalizable way. Their removal, their removal from human systems makes them a safe cipher for allegorical and metaphorical ideas that we could not express otherwise. We're not Dr. Doolittles, of course. We can't necessarily read their minds. These real animals don't speak, so we give them voice. There's a real idea of um, gifting these animals with the voice, with human problems. I mean, that's a bit of a burden as well, but as a way to engage with them more deeply. This is, at some level, I can't deny it, repressive and human-centric, right? We are putting animals in our own image, just as Xenophanes, the pre-Socratic philosopher, would say that if horses had brains and pens, they would draw gods to look like horses. Uh, this is just the kind of internal anthropomorphism, anthropocentrism, excuse me, that, that we're dealing with. But there's also something radical about the uniformity of life here, that we're all in this together, and that by being out, stepping outside of ourselves as humans, we're able to rethink our own uh, behavior and identity. So one last note then. My three points for this talk were performance, behavior, and identity. And I wanna see, I I've talked about those as related, but I see that there's actually a bit of a concatenation that one can draw here. That behaviors are learned, are hard for us to get out of. But performance, theater, allows us to be something that we're not for a little while. The more we perform, and Plato's tapped into this, the more that that becomes our behavior. And the more that we change our behaviors, the more that we're changing our identity. That's how Aristotle defines our ethos. It's what we do repeatedly. That's the most behavioralist way of thinking about who we are. So what do animals do? Why do we act like animals acting like men? By doing this performance, we're able to change our behavior and ultimately change our identity. We might do this like make me do and become tyrants, but I hope, 
And the challenge for all of us is using this power to become better people, better humans. Uh, that was the t title that Max gave me, but that's the one I want to end with. Thank you all very much for staying with me on this late evening. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Can you hear the chorus of applause, the virtual applause? Well, thank you so much, Al. That was uh, excellent. Um, and and we, loved the, uh, we loved all of the images of animals and, and witty animals, mean animals, people act dressing up like a lot of shape-shifting going on there. Fantastic. I want to remind folks we have uh, some time for questions, so please use the question and answer button at the bottom there. But I will start out. I'm very curious about the audience for these plays um, and about, can you speak some about how Greeks lived with animals? I'm thinking about, you know, certainly in, you know, early modern Europe or even in modern Europe, actually, that people, you know, there was a big distinction between the urban and the rural. And in the rural places, people were literally living with their animals, I mean, you know, living in the same house with their cows, etc. And is, was there a distinction between the city and the country and the way that these might really speak to an urban audience as opposed to people that lived with animals more? I, I get a little bit of an inquit question, but. Yes, no, it, I, it's a great question. Um, one that I don't have a great answer to in the sense that this is outside of my expertise. What I can say from what I know from the archeology span that I have read, um, it's not about one, uh, that the city is an anti-animal space and that the outside is somehow more animaled. Uh, it's that it's animals change, <laughs> that you've got goats, that you've got chickens, that you've got smaller animals within the city you know, limits everywhere. And if you go, I mean, if you're on the Acropolis today, the wild dogs and cats that are just overrunning this are, are, is incredible. Um, something that we don't have here. Again, there's probably pros and cons to that. It's the outside, it's the agrarian buffer, this liminal space where you get into having your oxen, having your pigs, having your larger animals. These are of course essential to some major sacrifices, but lots of sacrifices with piglets or with uh, um, goats or uh, small birds as well, which could f factor into this. So Greeks were surrounded by animals. They lived cheek by jowl or beak by jowl uh, with them and that informs the way that we should read these plays. We should read these as not height of civilization and urbanity, uh, but really as agrarian stories. I, I think no Athenian was that far from, from a field that was being pulled by, uh, or, or plow was being pulled by an ox. Thank you for that, it's very helpful. I have a question here from Abby. Hello, Abby. Uh, can you comment on how Greek mythology discusses how Prometheus and his brother gave attributes to all the animals of the earth? Uh, in this, humans were just another animal. They only rise above once they receive fire. Yes. Uh, so the, the Prometheus Epimetheus story, and this is again getting us back to Hesiod. So an early and formative text, uh, um, as close to a religious text as we get from the ancient world, Hesiod and Homer, uh, but these things weren't necessarily codified. We don't want to think of them as our Bible. It's different from the Genesis story. I should just say that you know this is not giving man dominion of all things, but you're exactly right that in terms of the creation myth, it's not, a, humans aren't put on a very different pedestal. They're really next to it, and it's this technological development that starts really you know, fueling, to use a fire metaphor, uh, the divergence between humans and animals. But um, Aristotle will be uh, emphatic on making a distinction between animals and humans, although he'll call us political and so on. Uh, we're political animals as well. So it, he's not absolute about this, but it's the fourth century where one really starts to see this separation emerge. If you go back to not just the, the Hesiodic narratives, but any of these early myths, centaurs, um, satyrs, there's so many characters that push the question of this hybridity. Um, they, they certainly thought that humans were the most beautiful, their gods were humans, but they were open uh, to these differences. I've, I'd forgotten about the Epimetheus and Prometheus. I should have brought that in. Thank you for bringing it in, Abby, to the discussion now. That's great. We, you can always count on CPH uh, audiences <laughs> for being very, very knowledgeable. I have to do my own work. Uh, I have a question here from Jonathan Gerard. Uh, Jonathan writes, I think of the song, and I'm going to mispronounce, either Donna Donna or Dona Dona, there's one N in that, about a swallow mocking a calf on the way to slaughter. Does it also speak uh, to us of the desire to transform our enslaved condition and seek freedom like the swallow? 
I've been thinking a lot about that uh, and for the past hour and a half after. Can you hum the song? I don't know. No, song. I don't know the Donna 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 <laughs> song. So, but but I, I beautifully described by Jonathan, right? We know what this is because we've also seen it already in the story of the uh, wolf and the dog, uh, that the conditions that we subject these animals too that are on the uh, boundaries of human existence is very different and i mean we saw this in birds too um giving um in, in franchising animal species or subsets or just animals in 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 the in full full stop i mean we're, we're seeing one could take the sort of philadelphia move argument of animal liberation and see it prefigured in a lot of greek literature uh, this is something that's always a bit of a scary thing and it's not accidental that heracles the kind of ur uh, Athen uh, greek male you know spends half of his career dominating wild animals but then it's also telling that he wears the lion skin over himself almost like the wolf in sheep's clothing uh, that even as he's asserting man's dominion over nature, uh, he can't fully part with that kind of shamanistic animal connection. I wish I knew the song. I think I would give this a better response, but power is written into every word of these. Well, uh, Al, you should know that while you're sitting up there talking, we're feverishly trying to find things out. We found out that it is a, a Yiddish folk song. Oh, all right. And we believe we found a version with Joan Baez singing it and have posted it into the chat. Drop that in the chat. Drop thank you. Yes. The chat. Yeah, we hope, it's the, we hope it's the same version. But thank you for that, Jonathan. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Jo yeah, John, he wrote Joan Baez sings it, Donovan, too. So uh, I know Jonathan is up on his, uh, his Yiddish music, but he's also up on his 60s giants. Yeah. So. I have a question here from our dear friend Lloyd Kramer. Hi, Lloyd. Uh, given the centrality of uh, animals and stories that convey wisdom or political meanings, why was animal sacrifice so important in Greek culture? Is this a paradox? Great question, Lloyd. Bigger than uh, junior professor Al Duncan can possibly respond to on its own, but I can send you to places and Walter Burkhardt the uh, German kind of cultural historian anthropologist of the late 20th century uh, wrote a fantastic book called Homo Nekans man the um, uh, like harmer man, harmful man in thinking about the various ways that man's sacrificial domination of animals was a complete affront to nature so there are all these rituals, these very subtle rituals built into Greek sacrifice. One is when you lead the ox or the, um, maybe the bull to slaughter, you throw barley flakes or you know, kind of you know, hold barley on its head uh, and it nods in response, which is then taken as a scent. <laughs> Uh, that it's now willing to be killed. For some of these um, festivals at Athens, they would kill the, the um, animal, uh, and then they would have a mock trial for the sacrificial blade, condemn it for murder, and then expunge it into the sea. So it could carry the guilt as a kind of pharmacos or scapegoat for this ritual. Um, in a world before refrigeration um, and at a culture that loved large animal or large festive gatherings, feeding people was a huge logistical operation and animal sacrifice was a part of that. So we see how it was a necessary evil, but they were very uncomfortable about it. Um, and we see even in Virgil where cutting grasses uh, can you know, start bleeding. There's a real worry in a lot of myth about this transferability, this fungibility between humans and animals. Uh, this isn't a uh, culture that believed in uh, transmigration of souls or coming back in these, but very aware of you know, words like psuche, uh, the Greek word for soul, could be applied to animals as well. There wasn't a strong metaphysical distinction about the life force between animals and humans, which makes any sort of um, improper subjugation of an animal or, of course, its murder uh, very troubling. I think I'm going to become vegan after this talk. Uh, well, I will say we had a wonderful talk of uh, maybe time is relative a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, Fred Naden, of course, from the University of North Carolina, gave a wonderful talk on animal sacrifice. So getting into some of the details of that, we can maybe dig that up. Yes, I should have cited locally because Fred has become the expert on these things. Yeah, uh, hopefully we don't have an actual animal sacrifice uh, <laughs> seminar there. But at any rate, uh, I, have, I want to get to this question because it's from our panelist, our co-panelist, Sharon Holland 
Hi, uh, from home has uh, asked up uh, really intrigued by the idea of performance and utopia I love how this work of yours weaves the two can you say more about utopia in your work well my work um, I dwell on the ugly <laughs> So this has been a little bit outside my wheelhouse, outside of thinking of Aesop as an ugly person. Uh, but I love this about theater, and utopianism and Aristophanes go hand in hand. Uh, Birds is maybe the, the most utopian of all the narratives. But in each Aristophanes play, um, the, there's a will to power, you know, of some sort from the protagonist who sees the world in, in some way that's just a little bit off kilter and wants to realize something. So in Aristophanes' first play that survives, Acarnians, a war is going on, he sets a separate peace for himself. And this, again, not, it's, it's material, it's not animal per, precisely, but animal parts are involved. He gets a goat skin filled with wine, and there's three different vintages of wine, a one year, a five year, and a 30 year. And all these things are supposed to be metonymous with uh, peace treaties. And grabs the 30 year peace treaty, the wine tastes fantastic. And that's what the, the hero, Dicaeopolis, his name means just city, seizes to become, to have his own peace for 30 years where he can then, again, like Make Me Do, uh, become a very rich merchant, <laughs> uh, exploiting this free trade zone that he's created. And he kind of comes to blows for that, but uh, not as poorly as Make Me Do. The, the, the point to all of this, Sharon, and everyone who might be thinking along similar utopian lines, is that animals have a role to play in fostering utopia and utopian visions because they are unburdened by a lot of the human social conditions, which are the proper target of Aristophanic ire. I wish we saw more animals in Greek tragedy. Maybe they're there and I'm not thinking of them. Uh, there's a lost play of Euripides, the Philoctetes. Uh, Philoctetes, we have the Sophocles version where he's marooned on an island, uh, Tom Hanks style, for 10 years while the Trojan War goes on. He doesn't have a uh, um, volleyball, uh, he's got animals around. And he's shooting some of them down. That's we hear. How, that's how he gets his sustenance in Sophocles. But in the Euripides version, he seems to maybe, because it's a fragmentary text, we don't know, have befriended a lot of these creatures to have used some of the fallen uh, feathers to create his own almost Tyrius-like costume. So would that we had Euripides Philoctetes for a way of, it's, it's a sad tale, but there's also this kind of utopian return to nature. What if we have one man on a deserted island, but it's not truly deserted, it's full of animals. Uh, uh, and he experiences a return to nature. Uh, and he didn't fight in a completely deadly, completely unnecessary foreign war. I mean, in many ways, uh, it's a win. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna just take this yes. here for one second. Ladies and gentlemen, thank Al Duncan. We'll do the old elbow, oh, yes, elbow bump there. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming uh, to tonight and remind you that tomorrow at 5 o'clock we'll start up again. Um, uh, I just want to give a little shout out to Karin Fennig, our next uh, presenter. We are blessed here at the university to have truly humanistic scientists. And uh, in the biology department, we've worked with several uh, uh, of the wonderful scientists over there. And every one of them is as much a humanist as every one of us. And you're really in for a treat. An excellent presentation on board. And of course, we'll be inviting Al Duncan. You can come on I'll back come here. Back. We'll be inviting tight. Al. Yeah, physical distance, not quite six years. We'll be inviting Al Duncan back. And of course, Sharon Hall will be joining us. Uh, tomorrow, you'll be in the good hands of Lloyd Kramer. So hello out there, Lloyd. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to seeing you for part two tomorrow night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Al. Thank, thank you, Max. Thank you all.